and now Canadian survivors are speaking out. So too is a Pornhub whistleblower who reveals secrets about the largest porn website in the world. So I just really wanted him to like me. He was definitely early 20s. I was 14. I remember in my childhood bathroom and opening the laptop. He was directing me basically in this chat. Like take off my clothes and show my body doing sexual things. This is a grown man who knows what to say. Ava was just 14 years old when an older man she met online groomed her to have virtual sex with him on Skype. And I remember the second I closed the laptop, I remember thinking, oh, what did I just do? The man did more than just watch. He had downloaded recording software, not to my knowledge. And when the call was going on, he was recording. Right after that happened, the video was posted on a social media website, and then it spread like wildfire, eventually ending up on dozens of porn sites, including the world's largest, Pornhub, which averages 115 million visits every single day. That's more than Netflix or Amazon. What was the immediate fallout when that video went up? It's the entire front page. It's the entire front page of this website. Me, 14, naked, with my full name. I, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, it's just a bomb goes off. Because you know you have to deal with this. Ava, whose real name we're protecting, became consumed with trying to stop the spread of the video. I would come home from school, and until I went to bed, that's what I was doing. I had Google alerts for my name, for every single combination of words that they could possibly use. Everything. That's all I did. I didn't do my homework because I was busy trying not to have my life explode. To try to keep her life from exploding, Ava didn't tell a soul about the viral sex video. She lived this nightmare completely alone. Oh, I can't imagine the isolation that you must have yeah. felt, the secret that you had in your family, yeah. in your close circle of friends, while all of this is happening online. Mm -hmm. I didn't say anything to anyone. I blamed myself because I'm like, what did you expect? But again, smart 14-year-old is still 14, you know? Ava sent Pornhub a message begging for the video to be removed. How did they respond to your claims? Like, hey, I'm underage, you need to get that off. They didn't. They ignored you? They didn't. I, don't, I didn't even get an actual email. And they tell you to put your email and like that they'll contact you later. Never did. Never got a response. Didn't say anything. Good afternoon. On behalf of our host organizations, we say thank you for joining us today. Thank you for giving your attention to a criminal network operating in plain sight known as Pornhub. Thank you to members of Congress and their staff who have joined us today, law enforcement, leaders, friends, and most of all, survivors. Pornhub owned by MindGeek is a virtual empire of pornography and film sexual crime scenes. MindGeek owns at least 160 other pornography websites, but Pornhub is one of the world's most visited pornography sites. In just one to two clicks, a parallel reality opens up where child sexual abuse material, videos of adult sex trafficking, and intimate content of unwilling innocent people is distributed with abandon, with few legal repercussions. We are here today to explain how vicious, how violent, and how life-changing it is for victims who have been harmed by Pornhub and MindGeek's business model. Please keep in mind today that MindGeek is just one of plenty other businesses and, and websites, all operating with the same impunity. Our first four speakers are leading survivor advocates who together have worked with hundreds of victims. Dr. Brooke Bello is founder of More to Life based in Saratosa, Florida who advises decision makers, coaches, and trains survivors, rights, acts, and spreads awareness. Terry Folitti is executive director of Breaking Free in St. Paul, Minnesota, an agency providing emergency shelter 
and direct services to victims of prostitution and sex trafficking. Chandra Wawantu is founder of CEO of Matera Empowerment, providing job training to survivors in New York. As a survivor of sex trafficking from Indonesia to Chicago, Chandra serves on the International Survivor Trafficking Advisor Council to the Office of Democratic Institutions and Human Rights based in Europe. Christine Shark is an artist, author, researcher, and activist based in Minnesota, a survivor of familial child sex, sex abuse, photographed and disseminated, unfortunately. But today, Christine is an author of Garden of Truth, the prostitution and trafficking of Native women in Minnesota. Thank you for joining us. Brooke, will you please lead us off? Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. So so-called sex work cannot be a breach of criminal justice. It cannot be a breach of criminal law. I mean, when the Free Speech Coalition was turned down by the Supreme Court to be able to put younger under 18 in porn, but then was able to, in another ruling, show someone that is actually 18 and up, but have them look like a child. That was sick then. Look at how far we've come when we didn't deal with it then. MindGeek's empire of exploitation is built on the monetization of sexual abuse and exploitation of children. It just happens because it's a part of the rabbit hole. We just heard that story. The reenactment of George Floyd suffocation and murder happens sick and violent and they dealt with this in germany sick and violent aspects of individuals being able to watch children victims being made to watch when you're trafficked you're made to watch porn sometimes wives are made to watch porn in domestic violence situations by husbands and men watching this and young people being exposed to these in, in, in act, reenactments of the holocaust issues chattel slavery and slavery and then gang rapes and gang banes and violence. And we expect with the iterations of technology and things coming in like VR, which we love technology, but how are we supposed to deal with the issues of the heart and brain connection and even have compassion for those that are part of the Me Too movement and survivors at all if our minds are being debased and individuals that are growing and becoming who they are are being sort of changed and pivoted because the mind and the heart is very sensitive. And as you're growing up, you're becoming what you see. And so violent images become less and less violent. This has got to end. We have got to call out Bernard Burge, the owner of MindGeek. We have got to call out Pornhub and they have got to be shut down because this cannot happen. And as a survivor who's come this far and all the individuals you're gonna to hear today, we are pushing and pressing you to think about it. Thank you, Terry. I mean, I'm sorry, I apologize. Thank you, Dr. Brooke. Thank you. Now we will hear from Terry. Terry, will you please take us into your discussion? Yes, and thank you, um, Dr. Brooke. That was well said, and I could resonate with everything that you were saying as a survivor. Working with so many survivors and being a survivor, <clears throat> I wanna make sure everyone understands three things. One, extensive movement between fronts of the commercial sex trade. Women are recruited into pornography from stripping or prostitution. Sex traffic victims are videotaped and material posted on porn sites that they have zero control of. People are recruited into adult films, then pressured to escort. The commercial sex trade tries to create false borders between the legal industry like, slip, like stripping and illegal crimes such as sex trafficking. These lines are more blurred and coercion is deeply embedded in all forms of the sex trade. Secondly, the physical and psychological harms of being exploited on a platform such as Pornhub is similar whether you've been in the life or you were passed out and somebody uploads a video of your sexual abuse, in both cases, you lose control of intimate images and it's a massive violation of your privacy. And number, and this has a long-term impact on your sense of security, 
ability to form long-term relationships and can lead to other addictions and coping mechanisms. And I know several of us that have had sugar daddies that have tried to get out of the life, that is a common form of blackmail um, that is used. The third thing is that online exploitation is becoming more common and impacting more people. I think it's because there seems to be absolutely no legal check on this abuse. But I stand beside my sisters and brothers here and say this has got to stop. And from seeing all the, the folks that I see on a daily basis, we are all impacted by this. And I agree, let's start calling this for what it is, abuse. Thank you, Terry. Thank you so much. Sandra, would you please go next? Thank you. So this is about life story. I am one, but it is thousand million of us similar like me. I was recruited to the United States for unemployment. It was American dream. It was American dream to get employment opportunity. And I arrived in New York. My dream then become a hell. I was kidnapped, sold into underground sex business by an organized crime. The trafficker dragged me, forced me to do something that I didn't want to do. Threatened with a baseball bat, knife, a gun, no food on the table if I didn't make the quota. Only drug and alcohol to make me starving and weak. The violent customer abused me physically sexually, verbally, mentally, after they paid, I'm no longer myself. I am the belonging, and they can do anything with my body. My trafficker often raped me, took a picture of me, and I never give consent for them to do it. And they do it to all of us, regarding adult or minors. One day I was in Masak Spa. I was trafficked in Masat Spa. Often customer came with the film crew producing porn materials. They abuse and rape me along with the girls with the hateful, abusive fantasies that I was exotic. It was real rapes and it was extreme abuse that I cannot express, I cannot say it. Can I refuse with the gun with the symbol of the death? I escaped, my trafficker arrested, and the buyer free, justice wasn't served. The fact, years after, I found out my name, my picture, and the film was uploaded into porn site and content illegal material, promoted rape and culture. They didn't, they didn't care about that, and we need intervention. We have to shut down the porn hub. Shut it down. I was granted by state federal to be a victim of human trafficking. I was served by TVPA to get services. But I become someone's victim of virtual sex abuse until the porn site shut down and shut it down. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you for sharing that. Christine, would you please go next? Bonjour, I'm an Anishinaabe and Cherokee woman living in Minnesota. I was used in an organized sex trafficking and pornography ring in the 1970s and 80s here in the upper Midwest. And um, one of the things that they did to me was to use me and other children um, starting at the age of uh, babyhood, toddlerhood uh, in pornography. And this wasn't just images taken of some naked children sitting in the corner. This was images of children being tortured and then being used over and over and over again by other perpetrators in order to um, be sexually gratified. And so one of the things that happens that when you're used in the pornography as has been spoken of here already is that you never have any closure because you have no control over those images and those images live on. So there is no closure for me I live my entire life dealing with the harms of being tortured and also knowing that I am that those images are being used over and over and over again. It's like being abused all of the time for the rest of your life, psychologically, knowing that that is going on. 
I have since gone on to become an advocate, which I have been doing for my entire adult life, actually, a writer, a researcher, and I focus on prostitution, sex trafficking, and uh, pornography being done uh, to women and youth in the Native community. Um, as part of the Garden of Truth, the prostitution and sex trafficking of Native women in Minnesota, I want to bring to your attention um, the barriers that most people who are in this sex industry, but particularly Indigenous women and youth face, which is poverty, 92% um, rates of homelessness in our study, uh, high rates of PTSD in the same range as combat war veterans. And I want to share with you one story that, that lives on for me, and that is a good um, example, a sad example, of the continuation of childhood sex abuse throughout the course of many of our life, our lives. And that is, I interviewed or talked with one Native woman who was 59 years old. She sat down at the table with me and yelled, I've been raped my whole life. What else do you want to know? She said that over and over again. And then she commenced to tell me about how she was first victimized at the age of four in child pornography. And her entire life then thereafter was just one way of sexual exploitation after another, whether it technically meant sex trafficking um, definitions, prostitution, pornography, whatever. It was just a continuation all the way up until she was 59 years old. And we expect and demand better for everyone in this country, Native women, all women, and youth, all of us. Thank you, Christine and others. Thank you for sharing. We do want to point out that the unveiling of Pornhub's criminality did not come from legal or public policy efforts, but from advocates and survivors. The movement to end sexual exploitation is so appreciative of Nick Kristoff at the New York Times for spending months talking to survivors like Serena on our next panel. Serena is joined by her lawyer, Michael Bowie. Also with us is Lila Micklewaite, who originated the Trafficking Hub movement to unmask Pornhub and hold its executives accountable. Her petition to the US Department of Justice to shut down Pornhub and hold its executives accountable for aiding sex trafficking has over 2.2 million signatures from 192 countries. And the movement is supported by over 300 organizations and hundreds of survivors. We are so thankful for these leaders, survivors, and advocates. Serena, we would love to start with you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I grew up in a very small town, like uh, on a ranch. I lived on a ranch growing up. Uh, I moved to a city when I was about 13, 14. And I'd never, I'd always been in a class with five other people only to move to a school with 3000 other kids. Um, so it was a lot to take in and I, I never had internet or a phone or a laptop or anything like that. So I didn't really understand the concept of, you know, once things were on the internet, they stay on the internet. And I didn't really know the cruelty and the just not caring for other human beings that you know, people can exhibit. Um, so uh, I ended up in a situation where a guy older than me asked me repeatedly for, for videos. Um, and after a while, I finally caved in and I sent him one. And that was the beginning of years, years um, of just anxiety, trauma. Um, it was put on Pornhub about a month after I sent it to the guy. And I immediately messaged Pornhub pretending to be my mom, trying to get them take it, to take it down. They would wait weeks to respond. And then I would have to say like, hey, um, this is my child. She's 14. Uh, do I need to get a lawyer involved before they would finally send a response? saying that they would take it down and that it you know it wouldn't be able to be uploaded again but sure enough a couple days or a couple weeks later it'd be right back on the site 
and I'd have to do this over and over and over again. And finally, I just started messaging them as myself, just saying, hi, um, this is me in the video. I am still a minor in this video. I'm still, I still don't want this on the uh, online. And this, you know, this is a very dark part of my life. And they'd make me go through all of these steps, just proving who I was. I'd have to send them pictures of like my, my ID next to my face, as well as like a piece of paper with my name and, and the date written on it and a whole bunch of other things before they would finally even consider taking it down just for it to be put right back up again. And so um, as time went on, it, I, you know, I dropped out of school. I started doing drugs. Uh, I became homeless and I, I didn't know what else to do. So I ended up with a guy older than me and he convinced me that because there's already videos, everybody has already seen the videos. I'd been bullied when I was going to school for the videos being online, which is why I dropped out. Um, he convinced me that it would be fine to just, to make money, just do more. And so um, not really knowing what else to do or where else to turn, because when I originally tried to tell somebody about it, I was told that it was my fault and that, you know, I, I should have known better and I never should have sent it to begin with. So it's just, it, it wasn't something that a 14 year old should have had to deal with, let alone, you know, continue to deal with all the way up until I'm 20 now. And just, just after the article, that's when, that's when Pornhub, you know, finally started deleting all of their videos and I haven't seen a video of myself up there again. But before that, it'd be up there. I, some people who, who I didn't even know, they'd message me on Twitter or on Facebook and threaten me, try to blackmail me, say if I didn't, if I didn't send them some, they'd send it to my mother or my family members. And then I've had people like find where, where my mom lived and try to blackmail me by saying that they would hurt my family if I didn't send them some. And it just, it went on and on and on. And I brought this all up to Pornhub and um, it just, it never made a difference. They really didn't care. It just continued. And thankfully now, thanks to Mike and Layla and everybody else who have been helping out, I'm finally off the streets, but I'm still dealing with all of the mental and emotional baggage from all of those years of dealing with it. Like, I, I don't have any friends. I just, I don't really leave the house. I have too much uh, anxiety, just knowing so many people have seen it and wondering if I'm going to run into somebody and what I'm going to experience because of it. So I just, I just stay home. And this is all from just one little mistake, something I didn't even know about when I was 14. Thank you so much, Serena. Um, I, I'm, this may be triggering for some in the audience. So if you need to pause and take a breath, that is okay, um, it's needed. Thank you so much, Serena. We're, we're here because of, of your bravery and for those who haven't yet spoken out. So thank you so much. Um, Michael, would you like to add to Serena's testimony? What well, I'd like to highlight for the legislators and law enforcement here is the nature and scope of the problem. Uh, put simply, MindGeek is basically a metaphor for this entire industry. And Serena's account, while incredibly strong and powerful, and impactful because she's speaking up for so many is, is so disturbing because Serena, Serena is an example of what has happened to thousands, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of women. In one year of investigation, we have spoken to and investigated over a hundred stories that sound very similar to Serena's. And the impact isn't simply um, it doesn't end obviously uh, with the 
uh, with the assault or and the posting. Um, it, 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 it takes life away from women um, and it derails their life. And so how does this happen? Um, and, and the answer is, which I think is critical for legislators in particular, um, is that this is an industry that is not occupied by responsible corporate actors. This is not Apple, it's not IBM, it's not Microsoft. This is an industry which for various reasons grew up in illegality. The most obvious and mundane illegality is that the entire industry, this online porn industry, particularly Pornhub, Geek, the Mac daddy of them all, built its empire on criminal copyright violations. They basically stole millions and millions of legitimate adult entertainment videos, put them up there, all of which was criminal. And they made a fortune. They make between 500 million and a billion dollars a year. On top of that, they uh, employed a business model where um, they put no restrictions on content because content was king. The more content they got, the better their search engine optimization is. And they made the conscious decision. We've talked to whistleblowers, we've talked to witnesses, and it is absolutely apparent from, from just overwhelming evidence over the years that nobody was better acquainted with what was on its site than MindGeek. It knew criminal copyright material was on there and worse, child pornography, traffic content and rape videos were on there and they didn't care. This is a group. That is, that, that is indicative of the entire industry. This is the biggest, most powerful company in the industry, but not the only one. And within the industry, it is not a rogue. The industry is a rogue industry and it will not self-police. And at the moment, the legislation is dated. Legislation dates from before the internet, from before the online uh, pornography industry, so that, so that while it fit, when the industry consisted of producers and some distributors, hotel chains, cable companies, it worked and it was simple and it, and it had a simplicity to it and the simplicity worked. These companies don't think it applies to them. We think it does in the main large part, but they think it doesn't. And even if, even if they thought it did, they don't care any more than they didn't care that they stole millions and millions and millions of copyrighted videos. They don't care. What needs to happen is the statutes need to be uh, need to be updated so that there is no loophole and no ambiguity, and that anyone who is in this industry who makes their money a billion dollars a year, industry makes more than that, must have the obligation, and you can figure out the mechanism, but there needs to be a clear obligation that they ensure that the content that's on their site is consensual and of age. Second, because of the nature of the entities that are in this industry who can't be relied on to self-police, the, the liability for, for that requirement of making sure it's consensual, there needs to be a vicarious liability that extends to others who do business and make money off of this platform, which would include credit card companies, banks, and advertisers. Just like we require banks and financial institutions to know their clients in the drug trafficking context, in the human trafficking context, in the child pornography context, it is absolutely neither unreasonable, unfair, or unduly burdensome. In fact, it's far less burdensome for them to do what they need to do to make sure that if they're going to do business with a platform, that platform is ensuring that there is consensual, that all content there is consensual and of age. And on, on my final point would be just to drive home how this is neither a burden nor unreasonable. First, this is an industry that is a wash in profit. Two, compared to the obligations we put on these banks with respect to drug trafficking, the task here is much simpler. And, and, and the evidence of that is, even though Visa and MasterCard had been briefed for over a year by organizations on this, about the issue, they to ignore the issue and do nothing. 
until the New York Times wrote a blockbuster piece. But they knew about it before that. They chose to do nothing because they didn't think they had any legal risk or responsibility until they were publicly shamed by the New York Times. And then what happened? Within days, they immediately announced they were going to investigate it. And then within days, announced that their investigation had revealed that illegal non-consensual content was all over these sites. Well, if in the course of a few days, they could have figured that out, obviously they could have figured that out very easily all along the way. It's not hard. It's not hard to ensure that the content there is consensual and of age. The industry did it for years. Those standards need to be applied to companies that are online and this is what they do. And some responsibility needs to be placed on those who actually, like Visa and MasterCard, who actually will self-police and thereby police these companies. Because at the moment, and perhaps that'll change over time, but at the moment, these are companies run by anonymous financiers. The people who are the face of this company are not the real owners. They're international organization we've investigated for a year. It is its own cesspool of tax avoidance and money laundering. These are not responsible actors. And so the effective police mechanism, in addition to law enforcement, but the more effective is to make sure that the people they need to do business with have exposure because those are in the main people who are subject to uh, public pressure and are in the main responsible actors who will respond to civil and criminal uh, potential liability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael, for your contributions. Next, we'll have Lila. Lila, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I'm going to uh, do a presentation today for you. I'm going to take you into the world of Pornhub and I'm going to show you firsthand why this company is complicit in mass sexual crime. And I just want to make sure that I offer a strong trigger warning for sexual violence, um, uh, depictions of sexual violence and descriptions of child sexual abuse. So please be forewarned about that. Quickly, the Pornhub overview. Pornhub uh, has been the most popular and most visited porn site in the world. Uh, 42 billion visits per uh, year, 115 million visits per day, and almost 7 million videos uploaded to this site per year. By far, the United States is the number one consumer of the content on Pornhub. Uh, this is mostly user-generated content. 80% of the content on Pornhub has been demonstrated to be user-generated, unverified, anonymous uploading. Anyone with a, a camera phone can record a sex act and upload it to Pornhub. Uh, Pornhub is owned by the company MindGeek, uh, a titan in the industry, a, a company that actually has a monopoly on the global porn industry uh, with hundreds or over, well over a hundred porn brands and sites. The Pornhub network is vast with hundreds of companies who are affiliates and partners. A Pornhub as of 2019 was uh, the 10th most trafficked website in the world. Uh, this company is making hundreds of millions of dollars every year. They do so through premium subscriptions, through advertising, and also selling user data. They also make it through the direct sale of videos on their site. There are six core areas of criminal content on Pornhub. Sex trafficking, child sexual abuse material, rape, incapacitated sexual assault, revenge porn, and hidden spy camera videos. Uh, all of this constitutes image-based sexual abuse. To give you some case examples so you can see uh, you know how this is played out on Pornhub adult sex trafficking uh, many of you are familiar with the infamous case of girls do porn this was a very popular Pornhub partner channel for years 
Uh, and uh, you know, recently 50 women have sued Pornhub uh, for being trafficked on the site for Pornhub, knowingly benefiting from their trafficking for years. Uh, check casting is another example of a very popular Pornhub uh, partner channel that was a sex trafficking operation. The ringleaders of that were arrested uh, and the company that had uploaded those <clears throat> videos onto these various channels had almost a billion views on Pornhub. Uh, you know, this extends beyond adults. Child sexual abuse material and trafficking is rampant on the site. Uh, one example that has been in the media is the example of a 15-year-old from Florida who was raped and abused in 58 videos on the site. And she was missing for a year, and her mom was tipped off that her daughter was on Pornhub being abused for profit. Uh, and she was finally recovered. There was recently also a case in the media of an Alabama man who was trafficking a 16 year old. He was raping her, trafficking her and selling her videos on Pornhub. Pornhub was getting 35% of the sale of those videos. A case in Palo Alto, California of a 14 year old being raped by a teacher. Uh, these videos uploaded to Pornhub discovered by a classmate. Uh, not only in the media are victims speaking out, but also on social media. We have seen many, many victims of child sexual abuse, rape, and assault coming forward to tell their stories. Um, and this is not a one-off case here and a one-off case there. This is a rampant problem on the site. Uh, the Sunday Times had done an investigation, and they said within minutes they were able to find dozens of videos of illegal content, even children as young as three years old. In late 2020, after the New York Times exposed Pornhub, and after a decade of breaking the law by hiding the child sexual abuse material on their site and not reporting, in only a few uh, weeks, uh, they actually reported and confessed to having 13,000 uh, instances of child sexual abuse material on their site in a very short period of time. Now, MindGeek uh, says that they actually have human moderators that are viewing every single video that is uploaded to the site. That means that they are complicit in the mass distribution of trafficking and child sexual abuse. Um, you know, this, the videos on Pornhub have obvious indicators of illegal, illegality, of criminal sexual abuse. For example, a video of a child that says, I'm 14. It's a video of a boy masturbating. Uh, tags on videos such as middle schooler and young teen rampant on the site. The trading of child sexual abuse material and comments that are on the site for months and years. Um, users who are passionately indicating that they're seeing videos of child exploitation and, and rape and trafficking comments like she looks 12 she looks underage uh, she looks uh, like a child and those kinds of things this is sex trafficking and what we know from moderators who've come forward is that Pornhub had the ability to actually flag these and view these content uh, view these uh, comments and and have their system set up um, so that they can be notified when, when words like child and underage were posted in comments. But instead of actually setting that up, they, all they did was hide these words. They censored the word child and underage and they ignored the warning signs. Um, they enabled the uh, ch uh, child sexual abuse material to actually be distributed in private files. So these are uh, files, images, and videos that are locked from public view or pedo criminals are actually trading on child sexual abuse material. The complicity goes deeper than that. They've actually instructed users not to report CSIM. And at the same time, they have not been reporting. They have spent over a decade uh, concealing the sexual abuse of children on their site by making zero reports to relevant authorities and child protection agencies uh, for over 10 years. Uh, and not only that, but they're actually advertising illegal content and child sexual abuse. For example, here's a video where you see in the tags, it says not 18, CP for child pornography. In the comments, it says that she's only in ninth grade. They put a download button on every single video on these sites where they actually enable hundreds of, of millions of viewers to actually possess these videos and redistribute them globally. Um, and not only that, in this instance, they actually advertise. So these moderators would have viewed this video, looked at the title, looked at the tags, looked at the uploader standing for underage sex, and then feature it on the homepage. So 
That means that they featured this video to get more views and more profit. We have numerous instances recorded where Nick Meck, the National Center on Missing and Exploited Children, has demanded that child rape and abuse videos be removed from the site. And yet in order to continue to drive profits, to continue to drive traffic to the site, they leave the title, the tags, and the views available on the site to uh, continue to be indexed in Google so that more people can use these child abuse videos to be driven to the site. Uh, and uh, they also advertise, promote, and suggest to users search terms such as middle school, extra small petite teen. Um, you know, this is the advertising of child sexual abuse. Um, it goes beyond children and women are actually blatantly sexually assaulted on this site drugged rape and assault, um, women who are being violently abused and things that are uh, clear indicators of criminal content being suggested to uh, users to take them to more illegal content. Again, all of these videos viewed and approved by Pornhub to be monetized on the site and mass distributed. Uh, you know, anonymous users were able to post videos uh, for over a decade. We have instances of real rape. These are real rapes in India, where the viewer is actually saying this is a rape, and that would be left on the site for years, generating profit for Pornhub. And it uh, also extends to image-based sexual abuse, which we also call revenge porn. Um, you know, Pornhub actually revealed its attitude towards this material in a public Twitter comment where they said, don't film yourself having sex if you can't handle it getting leaked. Imagine that kind of attitude from uh, the world's largest porn site in the world. You can see obvious videos of revenge porn all over the site. Some of these victims actually have commit suicide, have, have, have died by suicide because of the trauma. And uh, you know, there's instances of, of rampant uh, spy cam videos all over the site where women are being recorded uh, in locker rooms, in bathrooms without their knowledge or consent, um, <clears throat> hidden spy cam, voyeur, all very, very popular videos all over Pornhub. Uh, and it's not just the content that's on the site. The fact is that Pornhub uh, has been criminally negligent uh, in the, their moderation practices. In fact, we have documentation that they had as of early 2020 under 10 Pornhub moderators per eight hour shift. Uh, and they actually had 30 to 31 total per day for all of MindGeek tube sites. You know, this is actually a screenshot of an internal document that shows that on some of the most popular tube sites in the world owned by MindGeek, they only had three moderators per shift looking at these vi videos. And there's millions of videos being uploaded per year. Whistleblower moderators have told us that they had to view up to 1,200 videos per day, uh, per shift, I mean. And they said that we are aware that very underage videos were approved. And it goes beyond uh, moderation. They've actually enabled a Pornhub VPN to hide the IP addresses of, of even pedo criminals to make it harder for law enforcement to find and, and hold them accountable. They launched a mirror site on the dark web and their executives, as Mike mentioned, are hidden in the shadows. They have spent years hiding their identities using fake names and fake photos online, hiding themselves and they're finally being exposed. The New York Times blew this open in December the credit card companies stopped doing business with Pornhub as they should, and they deleted 80% of their site in 24 hours, 10 million videos. They upended their business model to only allow verified uploaders, but this did not solve the problem because many times the uploader is the trafficker. They still do not verify every individual uh, is age and consent in these videos. Five lawsuits have been filed since December on behalf of trafficked women and minors. And there's been calls for criminal investigations in both US and Canada. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Lila, for that excellent presentation. Um, this is the type of information that we all needed to hear today. And hopefully after we have seen it, we can't unsee it. So to put these issues in context of law and law enforcement, we are joined by four nationally recognized experts. Taina Bename, Executive Director from the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, 
one of the world's first organizations dedicated to preventing this type of crime. And Yasmin Vaf, who is co-founder and executive director of Rights for Girls, a leading voice of safety and justice for young women and girls, especially girls of color. Dr. Stephanie Powell, a former vice sergeant for Los Angeles Police Department and currently Nicosi Zone Director of Law Enforcement Training and Survivor Services. Lastly, but not least, Reverend Dr. Marion Hatcher, who has worked for the Cook County, Illinois Sheriff's Office between 2005 and 2019. She ran a diversion program for women exiting the life, a program she benefited from herself. She also led the National John Suppression Initiative, a nationwide effort with over 100 arrest arresting agencies and more than 200 partners targeting sex buyers as the driving force of sex trafficking and prostitution. Marion speaks not officially, but in her personal capacity today as an activist leader and US rep for Space International, which stands for Survivors of Prostitution Abuse, calling for enlightenment. Taina, would you please start us off? Thank you, Petrina, and thank you, Enkos. In November 2017, in time for the holiday season in New York City, where I live, MindGeek's Pornhub opened a pop-up store, a temporary storefront for retailers to reach new consumers. It was a test run for Pornhub, whose goal was to open permanent retail stores in New York and across major cities in the country. Several organizations, direct service providers, women's rights groups, including the National Organization for Women New York, anti-trafficking networks, and sex trade survivors publicly urged city officials to deny retail permits for MindGeek's Pornhub. Feminist author and leader Gloria Steinem, who joined the protest, underlined that the translation of pornography is from the Greek words porne and graphos, literally meaning the depiction of a female slave in prostitution, also described as a sex trafficking victim. I bring up the Pornhub shop as an example of MindGeek's unfettered determination to mainstream sexual violence as a cultural practice. MindGeek aims to numb us all to online sex trafficking and racialized dehumanization for untold profits and at the cost of destruction of so many lives with impunity, as we have heard from the brave survivors today. The New York Times columnist Nick Kristoff wrote that MindGeek, the owner of Pornhub, is, I quote, a porn titan and a technology company with the third greatest impact on society in the 21st century after Facebook and Google. MindGeek is an intricate part of the global multi-billion dollar sex trade, the end destination of sex trafficking. As one survivor whose sex trafficking and rape MindGeek still distributes online poignantly said, sexual assault on Pornhub is not an anomaly, it is a genre. The United States prides itself as a nation that values the rule of law and strong federal legislation must be enacted to combat online sexual exploitation and its profiteers. The US also strives to be a leading member of the international community. We are a party to the optional protocol to the convention on the rights of the child, on the sale of children, child prostitution and child pornography. And for the record, and as proof of our evolved understanding of the crimes before us, both the terms child prostitution and child pornography are, not, are now described as the sex trafficking of children or sex trafficked children and child sexual abuse material, respectively. The optional protocol calls for the national and worldwide criminalization of the production, distribution, transmission, intentional possession and advertising of child sexual abuse material, all of which fits into MindGeek's business model and conduct. It's important to note that while this law focuses on children, their 18th birthdays do not erase the trauma, suffering and damage of sex trafficking and sexual abuse. Brave survivors whose exploitation lives online tell us about the physical and psychological damage they endure well into their adult lives. The perpetrators and the consumers of their sexual violence remain indifferent as to whether the victims are 16 or 19 years old. The United States also ratified the protocol, the Palermo Protocol, to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, and whose internationally recognized definition of trafficking des describes the acts and means traffickers use for purposes of exploitation. While time doesn't allow me to read the full definition, the testimonies of countless victims whose reported sexual assaults, rapes, 
and sexual exploitation were distributed by MindGeek fits squarely as sex trafficking under this definition. We must further note that consent to one's exploitation is irrelevant in a court of law. Multiple class action and civil lawsuits have been filed against MindGeek for knowingly facilitating and distributing the recordings of sex trafficking and exploitation of prostitution. Last month, parliamentarians in Canada called for a full investigation into MindGeek. It's time for the US government to follow suit. We urge Congress to hold hearings about the probable engagement of MindGeek in facilitating sex trafficking, as well as the public health crisis MindGeek is fostering. Our government must uphold its commitments under the law, hold perpetrators accountable, and bring justice to these victims and survivors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Taina. And for the following speakers coming up next, we ask that you just continue to be mindful of the time as we're coming up on our last half of this um, very informative session. So Yasmin, would you please go next? Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to speak alongside such brilliant uh, and powerful leaders, especially the survivor leaders um, who spoke so courageously earlier. I think it's also uh, worth noting that we are coming here um, on Sexual Assault Awareness Month to talk about all of these injustices. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Rights for Girls, which is a human rights organization dedicated to defending the rights of girls and young women here in the United States. Through youth engagement, policy advocacy, research, and training, we work to center the lives and needs of marginalized girls and young women. Our work examines the intersections of race, gender, violence, and, and when it comes to sex trafficking and sexual exploitation, it is clear that young women and children of color are not only overrepresented among victims, but they are often blamed and punished for their exploitation instead of receiving the services that they need to heal. Girls and other youth of color are routinely hypersexualized and objectified by our media and our culture, which has been inundated with harmful and dehumanizing depictions of women and girls via pornography, imagery that's promoted and monetized on sites like Pornhub. In fact, each year Pornhub releases its annual stats, which consistently reveal racialized categories of women as their top search terms. The corresponding videos often depict degrading stereotypes of women of color and these damaging tropes cause real life harm to women and girls. From adultification bias, which shows that black girls are seen by adults as less innocent, more knowledgeable about sex or promiscuous than their peers, to the gendered and racialized violence that we have all witnessed against Asian American women in recent days. We also know that the internet has changed the landscape of gender-based violence and child abuse. And the pandemic has only exacerbated this crisis as periods of prolonged isolation and online exposure have increased screen time for youth and consequently the risk for our young people. Locally here in DC through partners like Courtney's House, we are seeing more and more cases of child sex trafficking and every instance involves online exploitation. Traffickers use the internet to groom, recruit, advertise, sell, record and distribute instances of sexual exploitation for profit. While sex buyers use the internet to seek, solicit, purchase, rate and access dates and online sexual abuse material. Pornhub capitalizes off these realities. Nick Kristoff of the New York Times said in his column that the site is quote, infested with rape videos. That Pornhub monetizes child rapes, revenge pornography, spy cam videos of women showering, racist and misogynist content and footage of women being asphyxiated in plastic bags. And we also know that Pornhub has been complicit in multiple instances of sex trafficking most notably the 50 survivors who are bravely suing Pornhub for its role in uh, facilitating a sex trafficking venture led by its former content partner, Girls Do Porn. That operation targeted financially vulnerable young women and lured them under false pretenses of legitimate modeling. And they also lied to the young women about their intents to distribute their videos. And then of course, in 2019, as was alluded to, a 15 year old missing girl was found online by her own mother where she appeared in over 50 videos on Pornhub and related sites. All of the videos were uploaded by her trafficker, again, demonstrating the unreliable age verification and consent mechanisms on Pornhub. It is clear to anyone who's paying attention that self-regulation is not working. Sites have little to no incentive to remove and ultimately prevent this proliferation of this content, especially when there are profits to be made. 
more concrete action is needed to help elicit a change, including more initiatives to prevent this material from being uploaded and shared in the first place. There are a number of bipartisan policy proposals that have been mentioned. Many have been introduced, including the Earn It Act, but in addition to legislative action, we need greater transparency. It is critical that Congress investigate these matters and help expose the public to the true nature of these companies and the harm that they cause to women and children as well as the public. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Thank you for your work. Stephanie, would you please go next? Yes, absolutely. Um, good afternoon. Um, by now, everyone watching this, I am sure that your hair is on fire because Lord knows mine is. And so it also kind of gives you a feeling of, of what can we do? What's out there that we can do something? Well, I just want to say this and that this issue is also important to law enforcement. Um, when it comes, when someone goes into a station and they want to report a rape and the fact that it's been uploaded to something like Pornhub, law enforcement knows what to do about the rape. What they don't know what to do is about the, uh, uh, the video uploading aspect of it. You see, officers are expected to know um, all the answers and to fix things and to make people feel safe. I know that that's the way that I police, and I know that um, uh, officers that are out there in the field, um, they police the same way as well. But however, when they have a feeling that they don't know what to do in terms of what to do with a certain situation, because it does not fit within a slot of either it being criminal or it being civil, that's why you get answers like, um, there's nothing we can do, or the fact that it's a civil matter. So you see, this is where the federal government and the federal leadership, um, law enforcement needs to be able to turn to them to uh, have a better understanding of not only what to do, but the fact that it does take um, a priority. You know, that the evidence is out there that federal laws um, governing sex trafficking and child pornography are being violated. That's very clear. And it's very clear that it's being done on a massive scale, so much so that law enforcement can't keep up with it. And so when you have um, Pornhub doing any and everything that they want to do, coupled with law enforcement not having the tools um, or the training to stop it, it actually creates a calamity without a solution. Um, and so therefore, it, officers and law enforcement are not feeling comfortable in terms of how to stop it. So how do you stop it? You stop it by not only shutting it down, but you have to give law enforcement the tools to make it stop. They want to make it stop. Federal government, give them what they need, give them the training that they need so that law, local law enforcement could do what they have to do in order to stop. Thank you, Stephanie. Marion, would you please end us off for this section? Okay, so let me build on Stephanie's point regarding the necessity of leadership, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, both local and federal. We need federal guidance rather than federal indifference. I've been a professional champion of law enforcement tactics at Center of Restorative Justice and Accountability for the last what, 17 years. Um, as Katrina mentioned, however, these are personal reflections as a well-informed citizen, as I'm not speaking in any official capacity because I'm on medical leave due to multiple sclerosis. Uh, in 2009, Sheriff Dart began implementing a new approach. Instead of arresting and charging exploited individuals, he put the focus on arresting and charging the drivers of this business model, this human trafficking market, the buyers, <clears throat> while providing more access to services for survivors like myself. His goal was, and continues uh, to be as a visionary to hold those who cause the harm accountable because the harm cause is immense and few public budgets can cover the cost of making victims whole. When he urged credit card companies to cut off payment to uh, Backpage, it was, it had a huge impact. I mean, he was sued and media mocked him, but he was right. And he is my hero. 
it's financial pressure like that that has made the most meaningful difference here in this situation with Pornhub. Visa and MasterCard's actions caused Pornhub to delete the millions of unverified videos, um, along with uh, Nick's beautiful article there. And so leadership and financial pressure and use of technology to build these cases against human traffickers and buyers who facilitate trafficking or upload material and evidence of trafficking is seriously necessary. Unfortunately, as has already been stated, um, it's difficult, if at, possibly impossible really, for victims to get this material taken down. They simply can't. And the burden should not be on them to have to take it down. Um, they experience massive shame and humiliation for the filmed and monetized paid rape that they are experiencing. On a personal note and professional note, you know, it's really important to say that in my trafficking experience, there were very few times that uh, sex acts were going on where there was not uh, pornography playing. And um, as a professional, uh, knowing, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Powell would agree, um, you know, many of the times that law enforcement has to go into areas and go into buildings um, to extract victims held against their will or just, you know, going in for sting operations, there is pornography playing in the room when they enter. And so this is a, a cesspool of uh, human rights violations that just plays and plays and plays. And it is something that has to be addressed. It has to end, it has to end now. And in order for that to happen, we need federal, state and local leadership to have the political will to promote victim-centered approaches and definitely increase the financial pressure on criminal networks and enterprises on and offline. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to all of our panelists so far. Thank you for your time and expertise. Our next panel looks at Pornhub, their business model, and explores the private sector solutions to this travesty. As we're coming to the remainder of our time, we do want to respect everyone's time as we plan to close at 3.30. So for our final panel, as we ask that you please keep your remarks brief so we have time for our final video and for Q&A. Up next, we have our senior attorney here in the NOCUS Law and then the Cozy Law Center, uh, Danny Penter, and also we have our CEO of NOCUSI, Don Hawkins. Danny, would you please start us off? Thank you. Um, and I just wanna echo everyone's um, comments about, I just feel honored and humbled to be presenting with all the excellent survivors and service providers here. The Nicosi Law Center and the excellent law firms we partner with represent survivors in a class action lawsuit against Pornhub's parent company, MindGeek, for profiting from the sex trafficking of our clients as minors and for the possession and mass distribution of their abuse online, which is child pornography. Pornhub would like to fashion itself as just another social media platform, but this is completely disingenuous. Despite the cutesy logos, internet memes, and publicity stunts, it's clear that MindGeek's business model is exploitation. MindGeek's billions of monthly views via web, its websites like Pornhub generate massive amounts of consumer data. And MindGeek uses its consumer data mining abilities, including user history, to create infinite amounts and suggest infinite amounts of content um, tailored to particular users and particular types of users. MindGeek generates titles and tags for every image and video it uploads so that users can more easily find what they want, even if what they want to see is torture, rape, child sex trafficking, or any other form of child sexual abuse. MindGeek even suggests search terms and tags, for example, so that pedophiles can find the exact content they want, which is child sexual abuse material, including that of our clients. For example, if you search the term young, Pornhub would helpfully suggest related search terms, such as virgin or extra small teen. And these keywords, search terms, and tags also assist with Google optimization, so that if users were Googling these terms, Pornhub or another of MindGeek's sites would be among the top results. MindGeek's business model and internal structure is built on search engine optimization. For this reason, 
even on the rare occasion that a video was removed at the request of law enforcement or NCMEC, MindGeek would disable the video, but leave the link live along with all of the associated metadata, keywords, and tags. So so that when someone is searching, Googling for this illegal, con uh, illegal content, they would still be led to Pornhub, where Pornhub could then helpfully again suggest similar videos with similar criminal features, such as teen, lack of consent, or incest. This, this uh, suggesting of content, it created more views. That's because it kept customers on the site for longer. And Pornhub sells data, they sell advertising. So more views means more money. It also functioned to drive particular content to particular users, even if that content depicted rape, non-consensual acts or child pornography. In other words, sex trafficking material, because this online monetization of rape and child pornography is sex trafficking. And MindGeek's indifference to abuse when it could be exploited for profit, went even as far to those that it supposedly vet through its model hub program. For example, our client, Jane Doe number one, at 16, was drugged and raped by a man who filmed this abuse and then disseminated it via MindGeek's model hub program. Under the terms of that program, MindGeek and Jane Doe's rapist agreed to share profits on views and downloads of, of Jane Doe's exploitation on MindGeek's websites. MindGeek reviewed, categorized, tagged, and disseminated videos and images depicting the rape and sexual exploitation of 16-year-old Jane Doe. In other words, they knowingly benefited and facilitated a sex trafficking venture and mass distributed child pornography. This suggesting of child sexual abuse material, search terms and tags related to crime scenes, laughably small moderator staff, infrequent police reports and contracts with sex traffickers make MindGeek's positions clear. There is money to be made on exploitation and they're not alone. Their biggest competitor X video operates in much the same way. It's time that they be held accountable. And that's why we also represent survivors in a class action against X videos. We urge all those who are victimized by Pornhub or X videos to come forward and hold these mega exploiters accountable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Don, would you please go next? Pornhub is not the only entity that should be held accountable for these atrocious crimes. Real justice can only be served as MindGeek and its many corporate partners and profiteers are held accountable. Several mainstream corporations have buttressed Pornhub in growing this system that monetizes and endlessly distributes nightmarish experiences with lifelong consequences for thousands. Visa, MasterCard, and Discover have profited themselves and they've lined the pockets of the world's biggest sexual abusers through their years long partnership with MindGeek. Even though the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, together with survivors and advocates from around the world, presented proof of the immense harm to these companies multiple times, it was only after the New York Times piece threatened to harm their reputation that they took action and paused processing payments for Pornhub. It is clear they see the strong evidence of criminality and potential liability for themselves as pressure grows from le for legislative and criminal accountability. Yet MasterCard and Discover have not formally or permanently cut ties with MindGeek and Visa has reestablished a relationship with MindGeek, all the while consistently refusing to meet with survivors of filmed abuse on Pornhub or with survivors of the pornography industry. Yet Visa continues to meet with the men responsible for their abuse, the executives at MindGeek. Visa's comments indicate that they believe MindGeek can fix these abuses through self-regulation, an absurd notion as MindGeek has already proven they are not capable of doing so. Websites like Pornhub and Xvideos cannot be made safe enough. Pornhub's self-imposed verification system has allowed approved porn studios to upload numerous videos of sex trafficked women. Pornhub is also not verifying consent of those depicted in any videos the superficial compromises that these websites are making right now, only after immense pressure, cannot do enough to prevent these abuse videos from being on their site. 
The so-called transparency report released by Pornhub this week is not only further admission of their guilt as they admit that they viewed, approved, distributed, and monetized 653,000 sexual abuse videos, but it's also full of lies. For example, they claim not to allow incest of any kind, yet 50% of the videos on their homepage yesterday, yesterday, contained incest themes based on the titles alone. These credit card companies are not the only ones who need to be held accountable. Roku, the most popular streaming device in the United States, is a distribution partner of Pornhub. While other leaders in the field, Apple TV and Amazon Fire TV, refuse to give space to Pornhub and hardcore pornography, Roku provides a way for users to stream filmed child rape on their 4K big screen TVs. We, along with many survivors and advocates, have been telling Roku of this abuse since 2017, yet they continue to allow their device to stream child sexual abuse material and filmed rape on Pornhub and MindGeek private channels. Discord, a very popular communication platform, especially among young people, has even given Pornhub their own dedicated server community, thereby acting as a distribution partner as well. Wish, one of the top online retail websites in the world, and Diesel, a popular clothing company, are featured by MindGeek as among their top advertising partners. MindGeek's own executives testified before the Canadian Parliament that 50% of their profits come from ads on their hardcore pornography videos. Time's up. Pornhub's measly attempts to fix these egregious problems must not stand as cover for companies like Visa, Roku, or Wish, who now fully know the extent to which criminal sexual abuse materials proliferate on these websites. It is not just about doing the right thing here. It's their partnering with MindGeek at this point is also illegal under US law. They must be held criminally liable under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And I, along with many others, call on members of Congress and law enforcement officials to bring justice forward. Thank you. We are in our final moments. And so we're going to ask our final panelists who are with us today to share with us for one minute, their one policy solution. We have Kelly Dore, Legislative Policy Liaison for United Against Slavery. Elisa Bernard, Director of Education and Partnerships of at a Seattle based organization called uh, Organization for Prostitution Survivors, excuse me. Autumn Burris, founder of Survivors for Solutions has managed one of the first successful John school programs in the county at SAGE, standing against global exploitation in San Francisco. Kelly, we will start with you. You have one minute to please share with us your policy recommendations for these crimes we've heard of today. Thank you. You know, as a former policymaker and one of the only survivors to help public office, I have a unique perspective on policy on the national level, um, how to write it, how to craft it, um, but also bringing survivors to the table. You know, some of the facts that we've heard today about Pornhub um, really need to be addressed on a, not only a congressional level, but state by state level and, and also localities. But we've seen that Pornhub is profiting by distributing child sexual abuse material, um, videos of rape, assault, film sex trafficking, non-consensual um, acts that are being recorded and put on there. MindGub, MindGeek markets child sex abuse materials um, and they are Pornhub's largest audience. The US Department of Justice and FBI should launch a federal investigation into MindGeek because no one is enforcing the law against deeply illegal and harmful practices. As a survivor of grooming and familial trafficking, um, I can absolutely attest that pornography was used not only to groom me, but to teach me what to do in situations where I was being abused. Um, you know, one of the things that we need to highlight and talk about is the Earn It Act. The Earn It Act of 2020, eliminating abusive and rampant neglect of interactive technologies of 2020, is proposed legislation in the U.S. Congress that's aimed to amend Section 230 of the Communications Act of 1934 which has historically allowed operators of websites to remove content from users that they deem inappropriate and provides them with immunity from civil lawsuits related to content with um, or content of such a user. So, you know, we've seen last July, the Senate Judiciary Com Committee marked up this bill and it was strengthened 22 to zero, went out of committee with bipartisan support. Senator Lindsey Graham and Vice President Kamala Harris were both on this. Um, what we need to amend and, and we need to revoke the immunity of big tech um, 
that allows them to um, continue to have child sexual abuse material, allow victims to use federal civil law, state and civil criminal law to sue platforms allowing these harms to uh, occur. Um, it also creates a new commission to devise the best practices for protecting children. Uh, we hope to see that continued bipartisan support led by Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut um, in the Senate and Rep Representative Sylvia Garcia of Texas in the House. Um, this will reintroduce the Earn It Act so we can rally around it and really see the passage in this session. Not only as we've seen today is porn a victimless crime, it's a crime that is continued and re-exploits the abuse of horrific, horrific trauma and many survivors have endured by allowing their abuse to be continued to be seen hundreds of times and for decades to come. It also affects the minds and brains of younger people who have access to pornography and gives a false sense of respect for a partner in an intimate situation. So we are also, not only are we seeing abuse on minors and women, but we're seeing nearly 23% of abusers, pimps, traffickers are themselves 18 years old or younger. We are seeing greater numbers of children perpetrating on children because of the access to pornography. It's currently creating a demand for child upon child abuse and that number will only rise if we do nothing. So we're here today to ask Congress to address the issues, put preventative measures in place instead of reactionary measures so we can stop the systematic cycle of generational and predatory abuse that is directly attributed to access to pornography. Pornography is a public health crisis and should be treated as so. We have the data to back it up and we're urging Congress to act on policy to show and stand with the survivors not only of Pornhub, but all sexual exploitation to allow them to understand their inherent dignity and know they can heal without the repeated exploitive situations being used against them for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And we're a little over time today because this is important. So please, Elisa, feel free to use your three minutes. Thank you, I appreciate that. Hello everyone, I am the Director of Education and Partnerships with the Organization for Prostitution Survivors, also known as OPS. We're located in Seattle, Washington. And at OPS, we serve women and girls who, like me, have experienced the sex trade. The youngest person we've ever served was 11 and the oldest was 84. So we understand the lifelong impacts that the sex trade has on survivors. Studies show that many women and girls in the sex trade enter as youth and become trapped into um, the sex trade into adulthood with fewer and fewer options for exit due to perpetual poverty and psychological trauma each year. The sex trade's impacts are both acute and chronic and the degradation we experience corrupts our views on our bodies, our sexuality and our relationships for the rest of our lives. Pornography taken and uploaded without our consent only furthers that harm. It keeps us in the sex trade due to fear of exposure and it perpetuates our exploitation long after we've left the sex trade, regardless of whether or not we were children or adults when this happened. As a service provider serving mostly adults, I urge you to consider the impacts the mass distribution of pornographic imagery has on youth as they transition into adulthood and how images posted without consent can become a method of coercion in and of itself for adults. We need laws that protect youth, prevent exploitation from happening and make pathways for adults to seek justice. The Stop Internet Sexual Exploitation Act introduced last December by Senator Merkley of Oregon with Senator Sasi of Nebraska is a logical first step towards addressing this issue. This bill would require platforms hosting pornography to verify the identity of those who are uploading videos. It would require signed consent forms from everyone appearing in the video. It would prohibit videos from being downloaded and thus disrupting further distribution without the individual's knowledge or consent. Uploaders who do not receive consent to upload would also be held accountable as it would create pathways for victims to take action against an uploader who posts images of them without their consent. It would require platforms to create a clearly outlined pathline for video removal, requiring that videos be removed within two hours of a request being made. And finally, it would direct the Federal Trade Commission in enforcement and instruct the DOJ to create a database of individuals who do not consent to use of their imagery. Legislation of this sort has been intentionally designed and is informed on by survivors. It's a first step to preventing and ending this insidious violence that furthers the indignity that survivors of the sex trade unrightfully are subjected to. 
I don't doubt for a minute that pornographic images taken of me while I was in prostitution were uploaded to platforms like Pornhub without my consent. And I live in fear that someday I will have to confront that re-exploitation. I can only hope that when that day comes, there will be laws like the Stop Internet Sexual Exploitation Act that will empower survivors to stop distribution of their imagery and hold accountable those who have profited off our continued exploitation. And I'll leave you with this. The liberties of free speech were not intended to be used to proliferate the mass commodification of marginalized bodies for the sexual gratification of others, period. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Autumn, would you please go next? Absolutely. Um, well, thank you uh, to all the participants and the, for the introduction and um, for Incozy for hosting this. Um, I believe that many people fear that Congress has become so ineffective and dysfunctional that common sense solutions that protect vulnerable people is no longer doable. I invite you to challenge this notion. We know digital platforms are making billions and that should not put them beyond the reach of the law. It does not make sense for Congress to wait to act. I hope these proposals, the Earn It Act and Stop Internet Sexual Exploitation Act are adopted. I worked uh, alongside others on gaining passage of FOSTA-SESTA. Um, I worked on the 2018 Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which was a complex effort to bring four bills together for final passage in the last days of the 2018 session and many other bills at the federal, state and local level. What we need is solid, creative state legislation. For example, I, I worked in California for decades. Right now, there is a bill by State Senator Dave um, Cortese introduced it's Senate Bill 435 this last February. There will be a link in the chat box to that bill. Uh, the bill confronts online sex trafficking, trafficking by creating a cause of action for victims, both adults and minors. It's really important. And of all the criminalities that have been discussed today, the monetization of sex acts on digital platforms, typically using fraud and of coercion. The cause of action can be brought against any person or entity that quote, makes, obtains, re-uploads, or distributes any form in any form, including electronic distribution, non-consensual, sexually explicit content, end quote. One of the most effective ways to combat any atrocity is to hit the perpetrators or profiteers in the pocket. And I mean the pocketbook. So these financial penalties are steep, intentionally so. For the, this is for the California bill. In addition to damages awarded to the victim, the distributor has to pay $100,000 for every two hours after receiving a takedown notice. The fine is doubled to $200,000 every two hours if the victim is under the age of 18. Serena so eloquently and powerfully spoke about her difficulties in uh, taking down the content and what that was like. And not only do we need to shut it down, but we need to be able to take it down. And that's what this California bill does. Um, I ask all of the California participants that are on this call to please uh, support SB 435. Um, and I want to end with just a couple of things, which is civil remedies is a part of victims and survivors' rights. The crime should not be a life sentence to the victim. The life sentences should go to, and the penalties should go to the perpetrators of this crime. 
Other proposals will, will emerge at the state levels. I believe that together we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing from your experience and your expertise. In any other industry, these crimes that we've discussed today would be universally seen as unacceptable and those responsible will be held accountable. However, MindGeek is allowed to not only host that content with impunity, but make millions of dollars from the trauma of men, women, and children. The United States Congress and US Department of Justice must hold MindGeek and its corporate partners accountable so that no corporation can get away with this rampant marginalization and exploitation of people, especially the most vulnerable, which is our children. It's time to shut it down. In closing, we would like to show you these highlights from the Canadian parliamentary hearings on the criminality of Pornhub, which includes testimony from Lion Geek's own executives scathing the line of accountability. I'm a victim of sex trafficking under the legal definition in Tennessee and the United States. I've had numerous non-consensual pornographic images and videos of me posted on Pornhub.com, but this is the hardest thing that I've ever had to face in my life. At times, I was suicidal. I sent them photos of my birthmark and even submitted photos of very various body parts of myself to prove that it was me. They still refused to remove them. It was not until after December 2020 when I filed a civil lawsuit against them, pro se, I emailed them a copy and the article came out in the New York Times titled The Children of Pornhub that they have now at least temporarily suspended these videos. Pornhub has become my human trafficker and they have been relentless in doing so. My name is Michael Bowie. Uh, I'm a partner in Manhattan uh, at the law firm of, of Brown Rudnick. Um, we have been investigating uh, Pornhub and MindGeek, its parent and its other sites for just about a year. Um, among, uh, included in that investigation are hundreds of accounts uh, that are similar uh, to Serena's um, of underage women um, who were children who had exploited material posted on Pornhub of adult women who were raped and the rape was videotaped and put on Pornhub. This is about rape, not porn. It's about trafficking, not consensual adult performance or entertainment. This is not about policing consensual adult activity. It's not about religion. I think even in these days, everybody can agree that no industry should be commercializing and monetizing in rape, child abuse, and traffic content. Videos on Pornhub titles, Young Teen Gets Pounded, Old man with young teen, young girl tricked, a club where you can play with little girls and it's so fun. Cute amateur teen drunk and stoned, first BBC on drugs. Stolen teen secret peeing scenes with video cameras inside a girl's uh, toilets, videotaping them without their knowledge. Amateur sex tape stolen from teen girl's computer. Daddy fucks young teen boy virgin first time. Tika Virgin from high school, Jakarta grade two. Jovencitas Violadas, meaning young rape from an unknown user. A drunk teen fucked by black stranger. Innocent teenage girls are used and exploited. Crying teen, passed out teen. Very young South American with the tags teenager and young. A comment says, this girl looks 13. Chinese Northeast middle school. Junior high school student, anal crying teen. I'm 14, with a video of a young boy masturbating. Gay 14, a video of a young boy masturbating. Panay Junior High student. I want to point out to the committee that any minor used in a commercial sex act is a victim of sex trafficking according to international law as well as domestic law. And I think it's very, very important for us to realize that. And put simply, in terms of knowledge, um, a search engine optimization company like MindGeek running this business model on its sites knows as much about what's on that site as NASA knows about what's going on in the space capsule. That is to say, everything that's going on. According to MindGeek's public statements and pronouncements, 
it reviews all the content that is uploaded to its site, which is to say it's an admission that all the child pornography that's found on that site, it reviewed. We should have zero child sexual abuse material on our website. And if there's, you, if any users, you know? no, because every single piece of content is viewed by our human moderators. MindGeek testified that moderators manually review all content that is uploaded to their services. Uh, this is very difficult to take seriously. We know that CSAM has been published on their website in the past, and we have some examples to share. The following image was detected by Arachnid. This image is a still frame taken from a CSAM video of an identified sexual abuse survivor. The child was pubescent between the ages of 11 to 13 at the time of the recording. The image shows an adult male sexually assaulting the child by inserting his penis in her mouth. He is holding the child's hair and head with one hand and his penis with the other hand. Only his midsection is visible in the image, whereas the child's face is completely visible. Mindy is a proud partner of NECMEC and reports every instance of CSAM when we are aware of it. My name is John Clark. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S.-based National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, otherwise and sometimes known as NICMIC. Before I begin with my testimony, I'd like to clarify for the committee that NICMIC and Pornhub are not partners. We do not have a partnership with Pornhub. Over the past year, NICMIC has been contacted by several survivors asking for our help, removing sexually abusive content of themselves as, as children uh, that was on Pornhub. Several of these survivors told us that they had contacted Pornhub, asking them to remove the content, but the content still remained up on the Pornhub website. A company does become liable under two circumstances. First, if they know about it in advance and publish it anyway, but second, if they are notified about it after the fact and fail to take action. And so that's the first thing. And in, in the case of Pornhub, both appear to be true. We've been screaming from the rooftops that we are long overdue for regulation. We as an organization also, we look at uh, the unregulated nature of the adult pornography uh, issue. And uh, there definitely needs to be more than a conversation about how we are going to take the keys back from industry. Uh, governments must, must step in and, and take a very strong stance at regulating what is going on when you're seeing uh, child abuse, child rape, uh, victimization over and over and over again. So let's talk about how many instances, how many times in 2020, let's just pick a year, how many times in 2020 did individuals reach out to MindGeek and say, I want content taken down because I did not consent to that content being put up. So we are uh, uh, preparing a transparency report that will be published very soon to close the 2020 year. Uh, which so let's pick 2019 then. How many in 2019? Uh, from the top of my head, David, I don't know if you know the number from the top of your head. No, at, at the top of my head, I don't have the number. And, um, and I so apologize you've come here today. That. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a worthwhile apology, although I would expect when I asked you what you would say to victims, I, I would have expected an apology there too. But at a minimum, coming prepared today, you would have thought you would have received that question. So you, you don't know sitting here today how many in 2017, 2018, 2019. How many times people reached out to you? In 2011, Parliament uh, adopted the mandatory reporting for internet child pornography. And there were two provisions in that. One is that if, a, if an online provider found issues of child pornography, that they had a legal obligation to report to police, as well as they had a legal obligation to report to the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. Uh, and Madame McDonald, that is you. So uh, we asked Pornhub about their uh, uh, compliance with Canadian law on this matter. Have you found them uh, complying in Canadian law in reporting these multiple incidents that we've had to deal with? Um, so speaking on that side of things, uh, very recently, uh, my geek has reached out to us to to attempt to report um, through that means. So sorry, I sorry. What, speak. When you say very recently, what do you mean by very recently? Uh, in the last few months. In the last few months, like maybe since the uh, New York Times articles come out? It could be pretty close to that time. When we asked them this, they said that they reported to NICMIC. How long uh, have they been reporting to NICMIC on uh, allegations that are brought forward? Their reporting to us has just been in recent times, recently within the last 
few weeks, probably. The last few weeks. Uh, the last few weeks, yes. Okay. And uh, from a former mine geek porn hub person who worked in management, who says, I fear for my safety, so I prefer not to give more details. But please investigate all the cam girl sites that MindGeek runs. I am certain many of these so-called models are being held in captive and trafficking situations all over the world. For example, women trying to escape North Korea will be held captive and forced into the cam studios in China by their tra trafficker who they thought would help them get out. This story repeats globally. MindGeek denies responsibility by separating themselves from the cam girl studios. Instead, these companies are managed as affiliate relationships, market relationships, but MindGeek is making a lot of money off these women held against their will. He said, ask MindGeek to provide all the financial records for all incoming and outgoing transactions in their affiliate networks for all business units, all pay sites, all tube sites, all cam sites, all advertising ne networks like Traffic Junkie. It will be clear that the scope of the problem is much larger than anyone on the Ethics Committee or reporting in mainstream media currently realizes. This problem is so much bigger than Pornhub. Also mentions uh, this former manager that he was discouraged from contacting Interpool when I con stumbled on child content by my superiors. I was not allowed to report this kind of content when across my desk. Now, the issue that's before us is that we have a law in Canada. The question is whether or not Pornhub MindGeek uh, has abused or failed to live up to their legal obligations. That to me is the, is the fundamental question on non-consensual images on Im issues of rape, on issues of uh, particularly child abuse. So I want to go back to the Canadian Centre for a second. And s you said that they began reporting somewhere around December, somewhere around the time the New York Times article uh, blew the doors off everything. Is that correct? So that would mean that like for basically 10 years of Canadian law, where we had very strong laws on the books, that they had not been reporting to you. Correct. That's correct. We we do report all cases to NECMEC, which then what they do is they take that information, they disseminate it down to the uh, cybertip.ca. So all that information is available. When did they reach out to you? You said that's been a matter of months? 20. Yeah, in the latter part of 2020, began. when the New York Times broke the story. Possibly? Uh, most likely. Most likely. Most likely. Yep. So 10 and, years uh, before that in the United States, where we've had a number of uh, survivors reach out to us from the United States, they were not reaching out to you to let you become aware or to work with them on helping these survivors, these victims. Uh, that would be correct. Okay, thank you very much. Merci. 2011, the Canadian Parliament passed a law that if a uh, internet content hosting service provider came across issues of child abuse online that they had a legal obligation to report to the police? That was 2011. That so how many cases have been reported to you by Pornhub MindGeek since 2011? I will ask uh, Madame Arsenault to confirm that, but it's my understanding we've only just been in 2020 receiving complaints. I cannot commit fraud legally on the internet. I cannot steal legally on the internet. I cannot sell you heroin legally on the internet. And likewise, I cannot uh, traffic child pornography legally on the internet. On February 5th, Pornhub executives gave contemptuous and frankly contemptible testimony to this committee, attempting to explain away all the illegal content that they promoted to millions of Canadians and millions more around the world. The activity that you are studying is quite possibly criminal. Pornhub does not dispute having disseminated vast amounts of child sexual abuse material, and uh, Ms. McDonald just confirmed that fact. On February 5th, the company's executives acknowledged that 80% of their content was unverified, some 10 million videos. And they acknowledged that they transmitted and recommended large amounts of illegal content to the public. That's not an answer to my question, Mr. Antoon. I said, do you think these people would have been victimized if you'd had December 2020 changes in place earlier? We can always improve and we can always do better. Pornhub promised you that they'll do better. But Madam Chair, will do better isn't a defense. It's a confession. Can you imagine an airline being allowed to carry passengers when every other flight crashes? So why hasn't the Pornhub case led to charges? 
Now, don't get me wrong. The work that you are doing to draw attention to Pornhub's atrocious behavior is vital. But you should also be asking why this case is being tried at committee and not in court. Here's the question. Does Pornhub's CEO belong in Hansard or in handcuffs? This is a basic question of law and order, of Canada's sovereignty over its media industry. And it is an urgent question. Canadian children, young women and girls cannot wait for a new law, and so neither should we. Thank you. We'll now have closing remarks and a call to action from Lila Micklewaite, founder of Trafficking Hub. Thank you. You know, the evidence of crime is overwhelming. And I want to see, and we all want to see on this panel, uh, three things happen as a result of this important briefing. First, we need to see a formal hearing in the United States. Uh, we need to follow the lead of Canada. And we need to hold the, this company accountable here in the US. The United States is by far the number one consumer of this content, of MindGeek's content, and they need to be held accountable in the United States. They have servers here, they have offices here, and they need accountability here. Next, we need preventative laws. This is an emergency. This is an urgent situation that needs an urgent legislative regulatory response, and we need to see legislation passed immediately. And third, we need to see criminal investigation and prosecution by the Department of Justice because a slap on the wrist for MindGeek is a slap in the face for the countless survivors who've had their lives completely destroyed by this predatory company. Thank you.